We continue our journey with the holy words of W.E.B. Du Bois and James Cone. Today we continue reading from Cone's final book, Said I Wasn't Gonna Tell Nobody. Today, selections from chapter four, when he put my name on the roll, learning from my critics. I'd expected white scholars to dismiss black theology, but hadn't expected that response from black scholars. I thought they'd come to my defense, but they didn't, and I felt alone and scared. I realized I had to think deeper about what I was doing. My critics inadvertently helped me to reflect on theology and the black experience in a more critical and complex way. Any critique that not address black self-hate was beside the point. Malcolm was right. The worst crime the white man has committed was to teach black people to hate themselves. Again, as Baldwin said, all you're ever told in the country about being black is that it is a terrible, terrible thing to be. Now, in order to survive this, you have to really dig down into yourself and recreate yourself, really according to no image which yet exists in America. This is no easy task. But as Baldwin continued in an interview with Stud Sterkel, you have to decide who you are and force the world to deal with you, not their idea of you. This is exactly what I was trying to do as a theologian. I felt that any criticism directed at me was inconsequential as long as they did not address the most vexing problem in the black community, self-hate. I wasn't writing for rational reasons based on library research. I was writing out of my experience, speaking for the dignity of black people in a white supremacist world. I was on a mission to transform self-loathing Negroes into black, loving, revolutionary disciples of the black Christ. White critics soon ceased to matter to me at all. Black critics at least were in my world. I could learn from them, but white critics lived in a privileged world that exploited black people, and even the best of them missed what black people were struggling against daily going to work, raising children, and forging meaning in a society that refused to recognize them as human beings. I am well known in some white theological circles for having said that white theologians should shut their damn mouths. Some took that as an excuse to say nothing about white supremacy in theology, America, and the world. After more than nearly 50 years of working with, writing about, and talking to white theologians, I have to say that most are wasting their time and energy so far as I am concerned. For me, the real issue when talking with critics, black or white, is this. What will liberate black people to think for themselves, to fight for justice, and to embrace blackness? Justice and blackness are the heart of what black liberation theology is about. People cannot live without a sense of their own worth. In black liberation theology, I was expressing black self-worth, which was denied or ignored by white theology and its churches. Saul Bellow said, what a man overcomes is a measure of his character. I overcame Jim Crow segregation in Arkansas to become widely known as the father of black liberation theology and a full professor at Union at 34. But that was nothing compared to what my ancestors endured and overcame. 246 years of chattel slavery and another hundred of segregation and lynching and white supremacy in every aspect of American life. In the midst of continued mental and physical brutalization, they created music that traveled the world. Not just the spirituals and the blues, but jazz and gospel, soul music and hip hop. I got my spiritual and intellectual strength from my ancestors. I am proud to be part of their heritage. Peace and blessings on the way.